Ezra chapter 10 While Ezra was praying and confessing, weeping and throwing himself down before the house of God, a large crowd of Israelites, men, women and children, gathered round him. They too wept bitterly. Then Shechaniah, son of Jehiel, one of the descendants of Elam, said to Ezra, We have been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women from the peoples around us. But in spite of this, there is still hope for Israel. Now let us make a covenant before our God to send away all these women and children in accordance with the counsel of my Lord and of those who fear the commands of our God. Let it be done according to the law. Rise up. This matter is in your hands. We will support you, so take courage and do it. So Ezra rose up and put the leading priests and Levites and all Israel under oath to do what had been suggested. And they took the oath. Then Ezra withdrew from before the house of God and went to the room of Jehohanan, son of Eliashib. While he was there, he ate no food and drank no water, because he continued to mourn over the unfaithfulness of the exiles. A proclamation was then issued throughout Judah and Jerusalem for all the exiles to assemble in Jerusalem. Anyone who failed to appear within three days would forfeit all his property in accordance with the decision of the officials and elders, and would himself be expelled from the assembly of the exiles. Within the three days, all the men of Judah and Benjamin had gathered in Jerusalem. And on the twentieth day of the ninth month, all the people were sitting in the square before the house of God, greatly distressed by the occasion and because of the rain. Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have been unfaithful. You have married foreign women, adding to Israel's guilt. Now honor the Lord, the God of your ancestors, and do his will. Separate yourselves from the peoples around you and from your foreign wives. The whole assembly responded with a loud voice, You are right. We must do as you say. But there are many people here, and it is the rainy season, so we cannot stand outside. Besides, this matter cannot be taken care of in a day or two, because we have sinned greatly in this thing. Let our officials act for the whole assembly. Then let everyone in our towns who has married a foreign woman come at a set time, along with the elders and judges of each town, until the fierce anger of our God in this matter is turned away from us. Only Jonathan, son of Asahel, and Jezehiah, son of Tikvah, supported by Meshullam and Shabbatai, the Levite, opposed this. So the exiles did as was proposed. Ezra the priest selected men who were family heads, one from each family division, and all of them designated by name. On the first day of the tenth month, they sat down to investigate the cases, and by the first day of the first month, they finished dealing with all the men who had married foreign women. Among the descendants of the priests, the following had married foreign women. From the descendants of Joshua, son of Josadak, and his brothers, Mehasiah, Eliezer, Jerib, and Gedaliah. They all gave their hands in pledge to put away their wives, and for their guilt they each presented a ram from the flock as a guilt offering. From the descendants of Imma, Hanani, and Zebediah, from the descendants of Harim, Maasiah, Elijah, Shemaiah, Jehiel, and Uzziah. From the descendants of Peshur, Elioenai, Maasiah, Ishmael, Nathanel, Jozabad, and Elasa. Among the Levites, Jozabad, Shimei, Kaliah, that is Kalita, Pethahiah, Judah, and Eliezer. From the musicians, Eliashib. From the gatekeepers, Shalom, Telam, and Uri. And among the other Israelites, from the descendants of Perosh, Ramiah, Isaiah, Malkaija, Mejamin, Eliezer, Malkaija, and Benaiah. From the descendants of Elam, Mataniah, Zechariah, Jehiel, Abdi, Jeremoth, and Elijah. From the descendants of Zatu, Elioenai, Eliashib, Mataniah, Jerimoth, Zabad, and Azizah. From the descendants of Bibei, Jehohanan, Hananiah, Zebei, 
and Atlei, from the descendants of Bani, Meshulam, Maluk, Adiah, Jeshub, Sheal, and Jerimoth, from the descendants of Pehath Moab, Adna, Kilal, Benaiah, Maasiah, Mataniah, Bezalel, Binuai, and Manasseh, from the descendants of Harim, Eliezer, Ishijah, Malkijah, Shemaiah, Shimeon, Benjamin, Maluk, and Shemariah. From the descendants of Hashem, Matani, Matata, Zabad, Eliphalet, Jeremiah, Manasseh, and Shimei. From the descendants of Bani, Maadai, Amram, Uel, Beniah, Bidia, Keluhai, Beniah, Merimoth, Eliashib, Mataniah, Matani, and Jeosu. From the descendants of Benuai, Shimei, Shalamiah, Nathan, Adiah, Magnadabai, Sheshai, Sherai, Azarel, Shalamiah, Shamariah, Shalom, Amariah, and Joseph. From the descendants of Nebo, Chiahel, Mattatiah, Zabad, Zabina, Jadei, Joel, and Benaiah. All these had married foreign women, and some of them had children by these wives. The Book of Nehemiah Nehemiah Chapter 1 The Words of Nehemiah, Son of Hakaliah In the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, Those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you, day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Acts Chapter 27 When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship from Andromitium, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia, and we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so they might provide for his needs. From there we put out to sea again and passed to the Lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us aboard. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Cnidus. When the wind didn't allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of Crete, opposite Salmoni. 
we moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of La Sea. Much time had been lost and sailing had become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbour was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbour in Crete, facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force, called the Northeaster, swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Cauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure, so the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So, keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. On the fourteenth night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea, when about midnight the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was forty metres deep. A short time later they took soundings again and found it was thirty metres deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless those men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last fourteen days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach, where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. 
The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. Psalm 13 How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death, and my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Proverbs chapter 8 Does not wisdom call out? Does not understanding raise her voice? At the highest point along the way, where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gate leading into the city, at the entrance, she cries aloud, To you, O people, I call out. I raise my voice to all humanity. You who are simple, gain prudence. You who are foolish, set your hearts on it. Listen, for I have trustworthy things to say. I open my lips to speak what is right. My mouth speaks what is true, for my lips detest wickedness. All the words of my mouth are just. None of them is crooked or perverse. To the discerning, all of them are right. They are upright to those who have found knowledge. Choose my instruction instead of silver, knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. I, wisdom, dwell together with prudence. I possess knowledge and discretion. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. Counsel and sound judgment are mine. I have insight. I have power. By me, kings reign, and rulers issue decrees that are just. By me, princes govern, and nobles, all who rule on earth. I love those who love me, and those who seek me, find me. With me are riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. My fruit is better than fine gold. What I yield surpasses choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness along the paths of justice, bestowing a rich inheritance on those who love me and making their treasuries full. The Lord brought me forth as the first of his works, before his deeds of old. I was formed long ages ago, at the very beginning when the world came to be. When there were no watery depths, I was given birth. When there were no springs overflowing with water, before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills, I was given birth. Before he made the world or its fields, or any of the dust of the earth, I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea its boundary, so that the waters would not overstep his command, and when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was constantly at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in his whole world, and delighting in the human race. Now then, my children, listen to me. 
Blessed are those who keep my ways. Listen to my instruction and be wise. Do not disregard it. Blessed are those who listen to me, watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. For those who find me, find life, and receive favor from the Lord. But those who fail to find me, harm themselves. All who hate me, love death.